he saw hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people come to faith in Christ. He this launched also different kinds of social reform in England that would lead to the abolition of the slave trade uh, under the leadership of William Wilberforce. So, and then that revival had spread to the North American British colonies. So the American Revolution was oh, very much tempered by the uh, Wesleyan revivals and spared the, the United States some of the horrors that would take place in France, where the, the church was identified purely with the old regime and uh, the oppression and injustice of the old regime that's being challenged by the new revolutionary spirit. Um, 1789 marked the beginning of the French Revolution, and it was a fully secular revolution that at first inspired hope and confidence to British poet Wordsworth wrote, bliss in that day to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. The sense that human reason could take on the world and remake it in a new way, a new and just way. But because it was cut from any transcendent kind of vision of what is good and just and true, questions go all the way back to our original talk about the Greeks. They had figured out on their own you know, different views. And he sent, first you have mass killings in the reign of terror. And then the revolutionaries turned on each other and uh, it would yield eventually to the rule of Napoleon Bonaparte who uh, one of the consequences of the French Revolution, one of the things that stirred the revolutionaries was a sense that France is ours. Up until the French Revolution, the French France had belonged to the king. Uh, Louis the Fourteenth once said that "L'État c'est moi." The state is me. Uh, it belonged to the nobility but the common people were there to serve their rulers. All of a sudden, the cry of the French Revolution was that, uh, was liberté, e liberty, equality, brotherhood. It says that France belonged to the French. It was ours. Therefore, when the European armies attempted to your, your armies of European monarchs attempted to crush the French Revolution. The people fought hard, desperately, because France was theirs. They weren't fighting for a king. They were fighting for their nation. You see the real stirrings of European nationalism here. And Napoleon conquered much of Europe. But the French armies went with their message the France belongs to us. But what that did is it stirred up in the nations of Europe. The sense, well, Germany doesn't belong to you. Prussia doesn't belong to you. It belongs to us. So they actually stirred up a lot of nationalist resistance. It would end in the defeat of Napoleon. There's an attempt after the Napoleon's defeat in 1815 to recreate the old order, but basically it was gone. The, you see the rise of different nationalisms in Europe. Italy, which had been divided into different city states, different provinces, Italy was united into a into one kingdom. 
Uh, Prussia defeats Pr France in the Franco-Prussian War and becomes a united German empire. Now, I skipped ahead a bit there because we're going to look at one more thinker that one of the most important thinkers is paving the way for the 20th century. It's Immanuel Kant. Uh, he lives 1724 to 1804. Uh, a few people have influenced the development of thought over the last two centuries, as did Kant. He taught that the Enlightenment was humanity is being freed from the thing, things of its immaturity, like religion, to the freedom of human reason, understanding. Kant's view of knowledge, you're trying to figure out how do we know? How is knowledge possible? He drew on the empiricists uh, and he agreed with them that all of our knowledge begins with experience. But he asked the question, well, then how does our knowledge get organized in our brains? How do we take that raw data to turn it into useful knowledge? And he believed there were certain inbuilt categories in our minds. Our minds were ordered in such a way that assembled and uh, the data into understandable and actionable uh, information. All our knowledge comes through our senses, but then those categories in our minds help us interpret the knowledge that we receive. But because all of our knowledge comes from our senses, from taste, touch, um, scent, hearing, we can never really know it's true. It's always moderated. It's moderated through our feelings. Thus, our knowledge is uncertain. This is lays some of the philosophical foundations for postmodernism. We can't know what's true. We can never really know that one thing is true. So we, you can have your truth. I can have my truth because we can't know what's true. Ethics, Kant claimed, is based wholly on human reason, and we, and the reason we should obey a general code of ethics, the general subscribe to a biblical kind of code of ethics, uh, but they're true because they make life better for everyone, and they should be just obvious. A widespread idea at the time, the American Declaration of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So Vishal Mangalwadi, who grew up in India, said, well, in India, that is not self-evident at all. In India, it's self-evident that some people are, uh, are more equal than others. Some people are superior to others. How do we know what life is better? What makes life better? We have to convince others of what our view, but we can't really know what's true ourselves. We're back with the dilemma of the sophists, we're back with the dilemma of the Greeks because we've re abandoned revealed religion, transcendent truth coming from the triune God. As it's the age of revolutions, the industrial revolution is making possible a higher standard of living for a large number of people because things could be mass produced and sold at relatively cheap cost. At the same time, the population uh, moving into the cities, being squeezed into the cities creates squalid living conditions and uh, increased 
different kind of poverty from what you have in the in the countryside. You have squalor, you have um, misery of the urban life. And what you had then is the beginning of another revolutionary movement in 1848. Uh, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels published their work, The Communist Manifesto. It opens with the words, a specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. It cl closes with a stirring call, uh, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains. One of these things I've observed in terms of Marxist, I used to be one, I was a Marxist Leninist revolutionary, is that what motivates most Marxists isn't a deep knowledge of Mar Marx's economic theories, but it's, they're motivated by a sense of injustice. And you see that anger in Marx, uh, anger at injustice. He the economic theories he proposes are, uh, are not well known to most Marxists. The social evolution theory that he developed in terms of how does history progress? Uh, you ask that to a Marxist and they'll tell you, well, you have a thesis, antithesis, and then you have a synthesis but you won't get a very good idea from them of what those things mean. What means you have a, one social condition, capitalism. It's challenged by socialism. Capitalism has machinery. Can, capitalism has a capacity for creating wealth for people, but it's owned by capitalists. What you need is it needs to be challenged by social ownership, which leads to revolution. And then you have a synthesis of the capitalist machinery that is now socially owned and benefits everybody and gradually moves towards communism. In 1859, one of the most influential books in modern history was published. Uh, Charles Darwin had gone on a round the world trip from 1831 to 36 on the British naval vessel of the Beagle and observed in his voyage differences within species in different areas of the world that related to conditions they lived in. Out of this, he would develop his theory of evolution. I want to read the full title of Darwin's book because it, uh, it can be, yeah, it is somewhat shocking when you realize what he's saying and actually develops further in both this book and his uh, other sequel, The Descent of Man. He wrote, title of, is On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. The Origin of Species has ex some explicitly, and even more his book, later book, The Descent of Man, has some explicitly racist ideas to it. Darwin believed that Euro European scientific advancement, uh, <laughs> that uh, Europeans were superior to Africans. Uh, now, the theory of evolution was not new. It's been around for 
quite a long period of time. Uh, but it wasn't generally accepted because nobody could give a satisfactory explanation as to how it might take place. And the breakthrough in Darwin's book was the uh, mechanism by which he claimed evolution would take, could take place. The me me by means of natural selection, the nature selected superior mutations or superior developments uh, and that allowed progressive change within the species. Now, I want to say I'm not making a specific claim about in this, about evolution and the theory of evolution itself. And I draw attention to Darwin specifically. There are many great Christians who embraced that. Francis Collins, who was headed the Human Genome um, Project, He's a wonderful Christian believer who believes that God created species by means of uh, evolution though he rejects the implied racism of Darwin. The church did not do a good job responding to him. Uh, and it was following the publication of his book that European imperialism reaches its peak. Uh, imperialism, colonialism. Remember, I was teaching in West Africa, in Togo, uh, on uh, colonialism. And I wasn't trying to uh, whitewash it, wasn't trying to make it sound good. I was noted some abuses, but I wasn't really going into the depths of it. And one of my students, just said, you have no idea what you did to us. Take a look at the map of West Africa. You came along and sliced us up like a piece of cake and divided us among yourselves on, on borders and lines that served your interests and took no account of who we were at all. The impact of colonialism, one of its impacts was to destroy the traditional ordering of African society. That we uh, made a new ruling class of those who were educated in Western universities. The traditional um, structures were destroyed. The, Under, as I said, this point, it's at this point that colonialism becomes serious imperialism. Between 1859 and 1900 is a period of imperialism at its peak. The British government takes over the official governing of India. It had been conquered, it was, had been ruled by the British East India Company. It's now taken over by the British government and uh, becomes the British Empire. The, it's in this period of time that the scramble for Africa takes place where Europe met in uh, 1884 in Berlin to divide up Africa between them. And that's where they took West Africans, sliced it up like a piece of cake, to divide up the whole of Africa between the great European powers. Only Ethiopia remained independent in Africa. All other Afri parts of Africa were colonized for the benefit of the European powers and their um, their interests. Say Europe took India. Uh, 
They established special European economic zones in China. And how did they do that? Because of the development of military technology and its perfecting in the West, the development of high caliber um, artillery, the development of repeating rifles that allowed Europeans to kill on a massive scale that had never been possible before in human history. And we took that technology to areas that were logically undeveloped and we conquered them. Believing that we were superior. Uh, Rudyard Kipling, the British poet of imperialism uh, has a poem where he says, take up the white man's burden, the savage wars of peace. Basically saying it was the white man's burden to conquer and rule the world because we were superior. Europe, People are getting healthier, modern medical breakthroughs are again further extending their lives. The standard of living of most people is increasing. Europe is ruling the world. The sense of optimism in the 19th century was palpable, where uh, most people were living healthier and better lives. The uh, Europe was ruling. <laughs> the world and they man rose up who recognized what it meant for there to be no god friedrich nietzsche he died in 1900 uh, if god is dead everything is allowed there's no limits to uh, human action, no limits to imposed by morality or ethics that what matters is uh, what I can do to make myself and make myself powerful. Look into the Superman, uh, the will to power, where those who have, have the power or have the ability can take power and exercise it for themselves. Sometimes if I have time, I read Nietzsche's parable of the Superman, Superman. Um, but it's, or we don't have time. Basically he, it's a powerful parable of what the implication is if god is dead i encourage you to look it up you can google it nietzsche's um parable of, uh, not the superman the madman parable of the madman it says god is dead and we have killed him and we're drifting farther and farther from the sun that was the center of our lives Europe conquered the world by its military technology. And it continued to develop and get better through the 19th century into the early 20th century. One of the reasons for the con Congress of Berlin, which had divided up Africa, was a fear that war would break out um, among Europeans over Africa. And so they decided we'll just have a conference and divide it up among ourselves. But in Europe grew and grew. You had uh, the Balkans, was a center of instability. Austria, the Austrian Empire, attempted to assert its uh, 
dominance or control, conquer the Balkan areas, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina. Then August 1914, the heir of the Austrian throne, well, yeah, in 94, I think it's July actually, August, in the heir of the Austrian throne was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist opposing the Austrian takeover of his country. And that led to the outbreak of World War I. All of that fearful weapons technology that Europe had used to conquer the world was now turned on itself. Some historians have called World War I and to the European, great European civil wars. And the casualties on the battlefield of World War I were catastrophic, numbering millions. The economic toll that rose from it were catastrophic. The social disintegration that happened in Russia because of the uh, world of the war led to the Russian Revolution, the overthrow of the Tsar and the end of the Russian Empire uh, uh, as it had been existent for three centuries under the Romanovs. The Austrian Empire, with the end of the war, the Austrian Empire came to an end. Most, the, many of the great European empires came to a close. Britain was effectively bankrupt. Uh, But more than that, Europe was morally bankrupt. It had conquered the world, it had subdued Africa, Asia, India, claiming its moral superiority. It was better, it deserved to rule. And all of a sudden, they had no moral authority to stand on as the world looked on the devastation of what Europe had done to itself. Again, I ask the question, where is the church in this? What is the church doing? Is it failed to respond well to Darwin. Not only did it fail to re respond well to Darwin, there was a growing new view of the future began in the 1830s in a prayer meeting where a prophecy came about the end of the world. Premillennial pre dispensationalism came into the church and grew and grew in its influence throughout the 19th century. Many of the great revivalists held to it that the end was very near. Jesus' coming was very soon. And that the church needed to focus on saving souls, not on working for social change, not working to see God's kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The on earth part bit would wait till Jesus would return. We abandon the world. And uh, the popular saying at the time actually was still very popular when I was a new Christian 50 years ago. Um, you don't polish the, bra the brass on a sinking ship. You don't rearrange the deck chairs of the Titanic. That's what social action, that's what bringing them, trying to build a better world. Or make just, just laws, help the poor. Those are just polishing brass on a sinking ship in a world that's going to burn. And as I say, the sense was it was immediate, it was coming close, and we needed to focus on that because the end is near. Now, I subscribe to that view at one time in my life. 
I have many dear friends who continue to subscribe to it in general. Uh, I, I think that one of the major problems isn't necessarily the view that Jesus is coming soon or that Jesus coming is what we'll call the imminent return of Jesus. It means he could happen any time. But that is the point. It could happen any time. But there have been Christians who've held those kinds of views throughout 2,000 years of church history. And the end hasn't come yet. What we're called to be is faithful in our generation. Uh, no matter what the when Jesus will return. I so you have an idea. Um, I personally think that we may well be here for another 500 years. I'm not looking for a soon return. I'm I'm always open to be wrong. And I, my view is that uh, God is God. I'm not. Jesus returns tomorrow, I'm ready for him. But I think he gave us a job to do. And when he gave us a job, go make disciples of all nations, stop, uh, teaching them to obey all things that I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And behold, I'm with you to the end of the age. I think he expects us to do that job. I don't think it was some a job description he gave, gave to us with the expectation that we would fail and he would have to come back and rescue us uh, from the rise of the Antichrist. So uh, I'd say I have dear friends who disagree with me. But I think we, as a church, failed the world because our focus became on the immediate return of Jesus. I remember I read a early version of, um, well, I call it early version of uh, the Left Behind series. There was a two book series written in the late 1800s about the pre-tribulation rapture and the great tribulation uh, similar to the Left Behind series in our day and that was 150 years ago they were sure he was going to return one of my goals, when I at least I hope one of the effects this week has on you is to extend your time horizons. How can we rise the challenge of our day? So the church has not done, did not do well in responding to the crisis. Crisis of the First World War moved in the crisis of a great pandemic the great flu um, epidemic of 1919-1920, moving into the Great Depression, the rise of fascism, the, uh, the growth and development of communism in post-revolutionary Russia, where millions of Ukrainians are starved to death, millions of other inhabitants of the USSR were sent to Soviet slave prison camps in the Gulag Archipelago. Uh, you had Nazi Germany, where there was a systematic attempt to uh, eliminate, to destroy the Jew, all Jews in the death camps, where the industrial capacity of Europe, the industrial skills of Europe had learned returned to the deliberate destruction and murder of a whole race of people. A war that caused 50 million deaths. It's estimated World War I caused 20 million, World War II 
caused 50 million and ended with the uh, use uh, of the atomic bomb against Japan, bringing into prospect the possibility of humanity destroying itself with its own weaponry that's developed. This sets the stage for the modern world, the world we live in today. Uh, Africa and the colonized world call, called for decolonization. India achieved independence. Indonesia achieved independence. Africa began to achieve independence in the early 1960s. I, I remember I was a school, I was in elementary school when I think it was Ghana was the first um, African colony to gain independence. It was sort of, this is a great thing. Africa is coming into its own. Part of what's underlying it was total loss of authority, total loss of moral authority by Western powers. We had nothing to say any longer. Now, what's happened? In terms of, have you had teaching of postmodernism yet? A bit. Okay. A lot of teachers have like briefly touched on it. Okay, is, is somebody going to come and actually teach on postmodernism? Often, often, usually, there's a. Not specifically, okay. No. okay. We've had teaching on doing evangelism, like in the 21st century, which I think maybe is the closest I get okay. to someone, but yeah. Okay, what postmodernism post does is it challenges the idea of a single united overall truth, or what it calls meta-narrative, that there's one truth that's common to all, that all can know. And in terms of his history in the West, when it looks back in and sees at one time, there's a meta-narrative of religion, specifically Christianity. Christianity was disproved by its history in the religious wars. So the meta narrative of Christianity is gone. What arose to take its place was a meta narrative that was based on human reason. The human reason, through uh, its rational understanding of the universe, through its uh, yeah, through its view of humanity would eventually lead to a better world. So there's, there was truth, there's scientific truth, there's truth that can be known by people. Sometimes, actually, in terms of, I find talking to atheists uh, rather refreshing, especially actually more radical atheists, because they, they say that I'm wrong. They believe in truth. They believe in reason, they believe in science, um, and that Christianity is wrong. And that's actually refreshing because sometimes dealing with postmodernism, say, well, that's your truth, and I have my truth. Because most postmodernism is basically said religious meta narrative, religious truth has been disproved. Human reason led to Communism uh, led to the Holocaust, led to the development of the atomic bomb. We can't trust human reason in that kind of way either. There's no human reason that's going to provide the answer to life. So you have your truth and I have my truth. There is no meta narrative, no one truth that unites all of us any longer. So you have no longer have any sense of universal identity either. You have to create your, your own identity. Christian identity was rooted in that we are created in the image of God. Uh, 
modernism, to use that word to describe it, identity is rooted in human reason and human sentiment. Postmodernism, there is nothing that defines us except as we define ourselves. One of the outworkings of that is some of the whole issues around uh, gender, transgenderism today. You define yourself by your own sentiments and there is no I, a number of American politicians have been asked, what is a woman? And they're not able to answer it. The, yeah, I can't spend too much time transgender. I have a, I do a seminar on that actually, but, uh, but our identity is something that we have to create. So we create our own sense of gender, we create our own sexuality, we create who we are. The church failed to respond to the crisis of the 19th century, or at least failed to respond well failed to respond largely to the crises of the 20th century. We're entering a new period of crisis. And that is where I'm going to leave, and I'll leave this as the charge, as a challenge to you. I don't think you're going to escape. You're going to be here for a while. And I say it both a good and bad way. <laughs> it's things are going to get difficult, uh, but you have time. So I don't. I can't really tell many of your ages, given the uh, dis your distance from me. But um, I think most of you are fairly young. Get married, have children, expect to enjoy your children, expect to enjoy your grandchildren. Believe God has a future for you uh, in this world. And that if Jesus comes beforehand, that's fine. But we're in a world that desperately needs to hear our message. We've lost the ability to articulate the message of the gospel to this current generation. That's one of the things that my thesis deals with. Uh, we, the, when the world hears us speak, they do not hear good news. The very message that we call, it's what we call our message, the gospel, it's good news. But the, when the world hears us speak, they don't hear good news. And, world looks at us, they don't see good news. And the challenge, even though I know the school wrestles with, and I challenge you to wrestle with it as you continue going through the school, how do I demonstrate to this world today that is so lost and so broken and so wounded, how do I demonstrate that the word we have is a word that's good news for them in today's situation. The good news I have for you in terms of that is that the church has faced those kinds of questions before and we found an answer for them. We saw Europe transformed. Patrick helped transform Europe. Um, the Wesleyan revivals helped transform Europe. The Clooney Revival helped transform Europe. Francis spoke the gospel in a way that transformed his world. That's the word that you have. And your challenge is to find how to make that real today. Amen.
Yeah. Thank you so much, Ed. Yeah, really, we enjoyed the uh, last few four days. Uh, personally, it's a lot of information. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking time to teaching us. Yeah. So this time for questions. Do you have any questions? Feel free to ask. Maybe in Ibadan also. I hope you are still alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you have any question or feedback, please feel free to say something. Yeah, we need a time to process. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes, Ivadan is alive. Thank you guys. Yeah, do you, do you want to say something? Can you hear? Can you hear us? Yes, yeah, we can hear yes. you very clearly, but we cannot see you, it's fine. We are always alive. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hello. Yes, go for it. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for the teachings. You're welcome. Yeah, and... Uh, the last word you said that when we talked, people doesn't hear the good news. Mm -hmm. Yes, and how are we going to how are we going to prepare ourselves now to reach to the world so that we can transform our world too? Very good question. Um, the place to start now, it's the answer to that will be different there in Nigeria than it is in Europe. And, uh, but what are the issues that matter to people? To what I realized in terms of the, as I began spending time with atheists and as deliberate conscious choice and develop relationships with them. So I needed to start listening to them first. I needed to hear what were the issues in their hearts. I needed to hear where they were wounded. I needed to hear what their concerns were. Because often their concerns are very similar to our kinds of concerns, but we need to he hear them say it find out how then how do we respond to that there's there's no sharp quick easy answer it's taking time getting time to know people to know the issues they're facing and to know how they're feeling about it mm. what are the um social issues that you face there in nigeria i i know a little bit about them. Uh, I I have a real heart for Nigeria. It's from my griefs. So I haven't gotten there yet. Uh, but what are the issues that are shaping your nation? Where do you see God at work in your nation? What's He doing? We need to learn. One of the reasons we need to listen is we need to learn the language of the world. We need to use, learn the language that the world uses to talk about things. So we're not using Christianese. We're not using just Bible um, verses. Now, the Bible is our basis of truth. The question is, how do we speak it? How do we show how to apply it in different circumstances? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Wow, great. Mm -hmm. Anything more from here? Yeah, Catherine? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you again, Ed. Um, just really brilliant, um, broad look at so much of history. Um, and just what has brought us here, the flaws as well as the good things, and then also just 
um, yeah, human beings disproving and proving certain things that they believe and different theories uh, based on life. Um, yeah, since a lot of the failings of the church come down to disunity within the body of Christ, um, you know, and Jesus is one of his biggest prayers, of course, was that the church would be one as the Father and he, they are one. What do you think are some um, progressive in terms of kingdom culture and transformation of nations? Um, that being the context of what I mean is progressive. Um, what do you think are some active, um, practical ways um, that we can actually dissolve these areas of disunity um, and yeah, where, where we've just so failed in the past because of our own battles and problems within Christianity? Well, to remember, um, I think there, we can look at the broader context, um, social context, but also individually. Uh, build relationships. And more, the longer I live, the more I realize how center, central it is to build relationships and don't let them get broken. Uh, I have had people respond in very nasty ways to me at, over different issues, um, theological issues and that. It could very easily break unity. And I've chosen, I, I actually, I have to say, I had to learn to choose. So I've broken unity with brothers and sisters over non-essential issues, over issues of his eschatology. Uh, and I've had to learn to, to reach out, to humble myself, admit I may be wrong, <laughs> have my basis for things, and I found that I can keep bridges of relationship open to people if I am willing to humble myself. It, and, and it's sort of rule number one as Christians, but we tend to forget about it. The whole walking in humility. I, same thing applies to atheists. I don't attend, attempt to be defensive about the failings of the church when I talk with atheists. I, uh, I am open about our failings. So individually, just work on relationships. Uh, there's, there's a poem that's been co-opted by the New Age, but I love it still. It's he drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But not love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. People reject us doesn't mean we need to reject them. If we, we keep reaching out, we can bring healing relationship. Socially, Some of it's just always been there in terms of the churches. There's all sorts of opportunities for reaching out to the poor uh, in our society. This thing, I think we're going to see an increase in poverty in the Western world. Uh, how do we minister, go as ministers of, to the poor? How do we go as ministers of reconciliation? I was just in Brazil. Uh, the last year and terribly divided around the presidential election. Well, my own nation, the United States, are terribly divided. Um, how do we not be part of the wounding and brokenness, but how do we uh, become ministers of reconciliation? There are ministries that are involved in this uh, reconciliation. Um, not only between Christians, but between Christians and Muslims a friend, and with different religious communities. A dear friend of mine works in Luton in uh, building bridges re between religious communities, seeking reconciliation, uh, representing the church there. Uh, so what, what are the ministries that we can do And I could, I could give you a list of things. I guess I'm realizing what is God saying to you? 
where is he calling you to? What is he saying for you to be involved in? There are all sorts of things you can do, but uh, what has he called you to? What is he calling you to do in terms of being a minister of reconciliation? There are actually some very helpful signs on a large scale. And I think Pope Francis is been a wonderful example of reaching out to build unity across the uh, or the, across the body of Christ. Uh, the patriarch of the Orthodox Church came to his to when France, Francis was installed as Pope. Uh, there are so on the large scale we see these potentially very helpful and very historic things. The, the Eastern Church has been divided from the Western Church since just early in the second millennium over matters of theology. How do we bring, we see steps towards reconciliation there. So what what's available where you are? What is God calling you to? What is he calling you to initiate even? But I say, I think one of the most important things for today in terms of unity is that we discover how God is calling us to be ministers of reconciliation. So good. Thank you so much. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Let's stop here. Yeah. Do you want to say some feedback? How, how do you feel? One or two people can share? quickly these teachings have been treasures thank you so much I'm really gonna come back to them um, and also allow the Lord to speak more through it um, yeah just just really really priceless thank you okay. yeah it was a great overview I, I said it each day I think but it's true like I really felt like each day was uh, impactful I was able to learn something even as someone again who was pretty familiar with history like I feel like I was able to learn I, I liked how you um slowed down at certain times to kind of uh, get us more into the characters and the main kind of people who were doing their work at that time and there were other times of course you have to speed up for time but yeah you're obviously very knowledgeable but you also um, you know incorporated and included everything that was important for a Christian point of view as well and uh really I felt yeah carried a it got heart well for for yeah, for, for justice and for his love for the world and, and for a right Christian walk. So yeah, I really appreciated it. it said. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for your feedback. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we would like to pray for you, Ed. So do you have any prayer points? How we can pray for you? One of, one of my common prayer points is um one of the atheists I am in regular contact with is my oldest son. Mm -hmm. uh, so my oldest son, David, is um, an atheist, and uh, we have a good relationship. We can talk about things, but uh, if, what's the most important my thing in my life, he views as being just a fantasy. So just... God would touch his heart and bring, um, rem remind him of the truth that he knew growing up. The other thing is, um, in not next week, but the week following that, I'm going to uh, Burkina Faso, and uh, I'll be t teaching there, and uh, just. Uh, yeah, just pray for wisdom, pray for health. Uh, it's, I'm not, I've never been to Burkina Faso before, so I'm not sure entirely of what I've been. I've been in West Africa, but Burkina Faso is quite different from where I've been, Ghana and Togo. So yeah, pray for that week. Yes, yeah. Okay. Shane, can I ask you to pray? Yes. Yeah. Okay.
And just this, um, just thank you for this week, the opportunities that we've had to learn. Um, and just thank you so much for Edgar and just uh, the wisdom that he's imparted to us. Um, yeah, we just want to list out his son David to him, uh, to you. Um, and just, yeah, and just pray over their relationship and over his relationship with you. Mm -hmm. Just, yeah, you would just show himself, uh, show yourself to him. So, um, and that, yeah. There just could be a reparation of that relationship. Um, mm -hmm. pray for Ed's journey to the Pino Faso in a couple of weeks, we just pray that, mm -hmm. yeah, it would be full of just meaningful, meaningful conversation and interaction with the people there that he's going to meet. Um, yeah, we just pray that your hand would be on it, that uh, the travels would go well and mm -hmm. be safe. Um, yeah, we just pray for continued healing for Ed. Mm -hmm. uh, that, his cold or whatever it was would just go away completely and that he would be fit and ready to travel again soon. Yeah, for all these things in your name. Amen. Mm. Amen. Amen. Okay, once again, thank you so much, Ed, for your teaching. Yeah. Thank you. And I've really enjoyed being with you. I've enjoyed the interaction we've had even via Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, surely we will follow you in Facebook. <laughs> if you have any question, we will just will come on your photo software. Yeah. Okay, then see you. In bye. Future. Okay, bye bye. Can stop, stop, stop.